Hello, everybody. My name is James Lindsay. I'm the sales and marketing coordinator here at Coach House Books, and welcome to the launch for Made Up, a true story of beauty culture under late capitalism by Daphne B, translated by Alex Manley. <clears throat> um, Thanks for coming out. We're very excited to be celebrating this book. We were excited when we got the chance to publish the translation, especially since it's Alex's first translation, especially since it's by Alex. And we were very aware um, of the book already and its popularity in Quebec. So this is just fantastic. Um, to kick off the night, I'm gonna do a land acknowledgement. Uh, we are based in Toronto. So I'll be reading our land acknowledgement from here. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on, just the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So to make this night extra special, extra fun. Uh, we asked another Coach House author near and dear to our hearts, Dominica Martinello uh, of the brilliant All Day I Dream About Sirens, uh, which came out a couple years ago with us again, uh, to host because she's also from Montreal, like at Daphne and Alex and uh, heck, they're friends. So we thought it'd be a good conversation. So I'm gonna bring on the great Dominica Martinello. What can I say about Dominica? Uh, she is a writer from Montreal and the author of All Day I Dream about sirens which came out in 2019 she is a makeup hobbyist and has an instagram account at makeup for books that's number four dedicated to sporadic book inspired looks she's working on a new book of poems called good want everybody put your hands together virtual or not for dominica martinello hello hi how are you <laughs> i'm great i'm so happy to be here yes i consider Alex, a dear friend, I admire Daphne so much. And I'm also uh, a big makeup hobbyist, as you mentioned. So um, I think I've said this to both Alex and Daphne, but this book felt like it was written for me specifically and no one else in the universe. Um, so thank you, you know, for, for doing that for me only <laughs> because I related so much to the content of uh, this book and it was just an absolute pleasure to read. So I'm really happy to be here just present in this book launch. Oh, you're welcome. It's nice <laughs> to see you again, especially since we haven't seen much of any of the Coach House authors who don't live immediately by us for yes. last year. <laughs> um, great. Well, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Dominica and you can bring out Daphne now. So I'll be uh, joining, coming back at the end. There is a Q&A function for everyone at the bottom of the screen. So if you have a question throughout the event tonight, drop it in there. <laughs> I'll come back at the end and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can. Perfect. So I'm going to introduce um, our stars of the evening and say a few words about the book, and then uh, they will take it from there with a bilingual reading, which is really exciting. So um, Daphne Bay lives and works in Montreal and is a poet and literary translator. She published Blue in 2015, then Delete in 2017, in addition to writing in numerous magazines such as Nouveau Projet, Liberté, Vice, Spiral, Zinc, Estuaire, etc., etc. Um, Maquillé has won the Prix des Libraires in 2021. So like congratulations and snaps to that. Was shortlisted for the Victor Barbeau Award and is nominated for the Eva Legrand Prize. Um, so quite decorated here in Quebec and soon to take over the world. Also published in France by Grasset. And then we have Alex Manley, They Them, is a Montreal-based writer and editor whose essays have appeared in The Walrus, Hazlitt, Maisonneuve, Catapult, and Electric, Liter Ugh, Electric Literature, among others. Their debut poetry collection, which I just <laughs> happen to have here. I'm happy that James also was just like showing off uh, books because I too like to be surrounded with, with them. Um, their debut poetry collection, We Are All Just Animals and Plants, was published by Metatron Press in 2016. Earlier this year, they were shortlisted for a National Magazine Award, no big deal. And they are currently working on a nonfiction book called The New Masculinity, forthcoming from ECW Press in 2023. So this is all very exciting. Um, and honestly, this I, can, I can't believe that this is Alex's first translation. Um, I love that the translation of Maquillet uh, has been sort of turned into made up 
because uh, this works on many different levels. This is a book not just about makeup or cosmetics, if you will, but um, ideas that we make up about ourselves when it comes to beauty and the culture surrounding it, um, AKA the late capitalism of the, of the subtitle. Um, vulnerability, and vulnerability and authenticity are made up. <laughs> Influence, influencers and their power are also constructed and made up. Um, these are just dolled up constructions that hold such a firm grasp on at least my consciousness and the things that I think about um, as a makeup lover and enjoyer and a, as someone who has had a fraught relationship with um, makeup and beauty culture as I have gone through um, my life. But this has really felt like a book, as I said, written specifically for me. I've never really had these ideas articulated in such a poignant um, and poetic way before. This book is also very accumulative. It accumulates power and references, um, both academic and poetic. And you know, also there's many references to my favorite soap operas, AKA um, my favorite beauty YouTube channel. So that was something very exciting um, to see YouTube held up as this uh, powerful medium that it really is in our culture and in my life. Um, so I have felt really privileged to get to sort of host this evening and be a part of it and read this graceful and living translation. Um, and I'm also indebted to Daphne Bay for exploring this territory in such a personal and generous way. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to allow Alex and Daphne to read from Made Up. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so nice. Uh, I think I'm, I'm the first to read. Yeah, so uh, we selected two excerpts that I'm going to read right now. Uh, I will read in French and Alex will read in English. So here it goes. Shmani. La pop star anarchiste a eu un bébé avec le fils du milliardaire. C'est un mouton gris vert de cash et de gun. C'est la preuve, pour ceux et celles qui en avaient besoin, qu'elle ne pensait pas vraiment ce qu'elle disait. Je pense souvent aux bébés qu'ont eu la pop star et le riche héritier. Je pense aux motons gris verts de cash et de gun, à cette couleur où richesse et violence, fibres indémêlables d'un même tissu, s'entrecroisent. J'essaie de comprendre la couleur, de mettre en mots sa confusion. Le moton est trouble comme de l'eau sale, il est opaque et ça lui sert. C'est qu'il voudrait masquer sa vérité banale, il n'y a pas de cash sans gun. Avoir un moton de quelque chose, c'est en posséder une grande quantité. Or, l'opulence présuppose la rareté, car elle fleurit sur la misère des autres. De cette, de cette relation étroite et essentielle naît la violence. Ce bébé-là tire du gun. Le bébé que la poète Anne Boyer décrit n'est pas gris, mais grisâtre. Il n'est pas vert, mais verdâtre. En fait, sa teinte malheureuse et inaboutie mute constamment. De là, son suffixe, âtre, c'est qu'elle tire toujours sur une autre couleur et se métamorphose comme un organe en décomposition. Le rein d'un cadavre passe du brun au noir. La trachée, d'abord blanche, devient rouge, puis olivâtre. La couleur trace un mouvement, nous enferme dans un cycle et personne n'échappe à sa danse. J'ai longtemps cru que les poèmes énonçaient des petites prophéties, qu'ils contenaient des présages, une mort, un concept scientifique, un élément manquant dans le tableau périodique. Mais loin de prédire l'avenir, leur image cristallise plutôt un phénomène qui est et qui doit toujours trouver de nouveaux mots pour se dire. En cela, la poésie n'est pas voyante, mais hors du temps. Plus précisément, elle ne correspond pas à ce qui se passe, elle est inactuelle. En fait, il y a quelque chose pour que la poésie nous arrive alors que beaucoup de choses qui semblent plus importantes ne nous arrivent pas, affirme Jean Cocteau, dans une vidéo où il s'adresse à l'an 2000. La poésie n'est donc pas l'actualité. L'actualité, quant à elle, n'advient pas sans poésie. La poète Anne Boigny se doutait-elle que le bébé fantasmé du capitalisme allait naître un jour, qu'un événement ferait la une des tabloïdes et lui donnerait raison trois ans après la parution de son recueil. Après tout, la poète n'invente rien. Elle écrit simplement ce qui existe déjà, car l'actualité, comme le bébé gris vert, n'est rien d'autre qu'une preuve pour ceux et celles qui en avaient besoin. Je pense que c'est là que j'arrête. Hein? Ouais. <rire> Ensuite, un autre euh, extrait. 
maquillée, calée dans mon lit, j'écoute une chanson qui parle de cash. Je remplis à rabord mon panier d'épicerie Sephora. Deux palettes de fards à paupières iridescents, un crayon pour les yeux et un flacon de rétinol. En un clic de souris, je viens dilapider l'équivalent du tiers de mon loyer. J'ai fait imploser une étoile, j'ai anéanti une, une famille de papillons, rasé un champ de trèfle. Bientôt, un camion viendra me livrer une petite boîte. Je n'ai rien fait pour freiner l'apocalypse. Depuis quatre heures, je suis scotché à mon écran d'ordinateur. La palette d'ombre à paupières Conspiracy, fruit d'une collaboration entre les youtubeurs américains Jeffree Star et Shane Dawson, vient tout juste d'être lancée. Seulement deux minutes après sa mise en marché, l'affluence des internautes a fait planter la plateforme de commerce électronique Shopify. « Y'all broke the internet » s'empresse de déclarer Jeffree Star à ses fans énervés qui tentent en vain de se procurer la palette. Ce crash informatique n'a pourtant rien d'étonnant. Ensemble, Jeffree Star et Sean Dawson cumulent plus de 39 millions d'abonnés YouTube, une véritable marée humaine. Alors que Shopify trime dur pour faire renaître la plateforme de ses cendres et permettre au capital de poursuivre sa course, des fans fébriles s'emparent de Twitter. Il y en a une qui publie une vidéo d'elle à l'hôpital. On la voit pousser son pied à perfusion jusqu'à la fenêtre la plus proche, téléphone en main. Elle veut à tout prix capter le signal et conserver sa place dans la file d'attente numérique. « On my way to the window, trying to get some signals so I can hopefully get the Sean Dawson, Jeffree Star conspiracy palette since I wasn't able to leave the hospital and go to a Murphy store. » Tout le monde est ému par cet acte de dévouement, y compris moi. Sean Dawson pleure, je veux dire Sean Dawson tweet des emojis de bonhomme qui pleure. Dans la salle de conférence où tout est filmé, quelqu'un lance aux deux acolytes qu'ils ont sûrement plus de poids que le président américain. Et c'est peut-être vrai, puisqu'en cet instant précis, ils exercent un, une véritable force gravitationnelle sur des millions de corps. Comme des astres, Shane et Jeffrey me font dévier, moi et tant d'autres. Ils obligent cette fille malade à pousser son pied à perfusion, à s'avancer vers la fenêtre la plus proche, à rafraîchir son écran. Plus de 2,5 millions de clients font maintenant la queue en ligne, impatients de finaliser leurs transactions, Moins de quatre heures plus tard, avant même que je puisse moi-même me procurer la palette, 1,1 million d'unités se sont envolées et toute la marchandise de la collection est en rupture de stock. Le lancement de la palette Conspiracy marque ainsi les annales de l'industrie de la beauté. Voilà. <rire> Thanks so much, Daphne. So here's uh, what Daphne just read um, in Made Up. Shmoney. The anarchist pop star had a baby with the son of a billionaire. It's a little green gray wad of cash and guns, proof for those who needed it that she hadn't really meant the things she'd said. I think about the pop star's baby with the billionaire often. I think about it, that little green gray wad, the amalgamation of cash, of guns, about that color at the intersection of wealth and violence, infinitely interlacing strands of the same fabric all come together. I try to understand the color to put the complexity of it into words. <sighs> Excuse me. The green gray wad as murky as dirty water, opaque, which works for it. That wad would love to cover up the banality of the truth, that wealth comes from the barrel of a gun. A wad isn't just a crumpled up thing. It's also a stack of bills. Opulence, you see, presupposes scarcity. It blooms brightest in the garden of other people's misery. That intimate relationship between money and violence. This baby was born a gunslinger. The baby that Ann Boyer describes isn't actually gray, more grayish, nor is it green, more greenish. In fact, if you look closely, it's an ever shifting mutable hue, hence the issues. It's forever on the doorstep of another shade, metamorphosing, a decomposing organ. Did you know that a dead person's kidney goes from brown to black? The trachea, which starts out white, becomes red before landing on olive-ish. Color is movement. It traps us in the steps of a dance, one that no one is allowed to sit out. For a long time, I believed that poetry was prophecy, that it could tell us about the future, coming deaths, impending technological breakthroughs, new elements put, pulling up chairs at the periodic table. But that's not quite it. Rather, the images and poems are ones that necessitate, that must continue, that must continue to necessitate new words entirely. 
in which case poetry isn't prophecy, but rather outside of time entirely. It's not a question of what happens. Poetry is outside of time. In fact, there's a much greater likelihood that poetry happens to you, while many things that may seem more important than poetry won't. That's Jean Cocteau speaking to the year 2000 in a YouTube video. In short, poetry isn't current events, but nothing happens without it. Did Anne Boyer know that the baby at the intersection of art and commerce she was writing about would one day be born? That three years after her book came out, that little green gray thing she'd imagined would be real live tabloid fodder? After all, the poet is an inventor. She's simply describing what's already there because what is reality like the green gray baby except proof for those who needed it? I'm skipping ahead a few pages now. <clears throat> Made up, ensconced in my bed and listening to a song about money, I'm filling my Sephora cart to the brim. Two iridescent eyeshadow palettes, an eyeliner and a bottle of retinol. With the click of a mouse, a third of a month's rent goes up in smoke. I just made a Stargo Nova, ended a royal line of butterflies, burned a field of clover to ashes. Soon, a truck will come to my door, bearing a little box. I'm not doing anything to slow the apocalypse's approach. No, for four hours now, I've been super glued to my computer screen. The Conspiracy Palette, an eyeshadow collaboration between the American YouTubers Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson, just dropped. Two minutes before its launch, the sheer volume of would-be purchasers crashed Shopify, the e-commerce platform the duo were using. Y'all broke the internet, Star hastens to explain to his frustrated fans as they try in vain to acquire a conspiracy of their own. This digital crash, however, wasn't just a rogue wave. Between them, Star and Dawson have over 39 million YouTube subscribers, a literal human tsunami. While Shopify works hard to rebirth the e-store from its ashes to permit the mechanisms of capitalism to resume their functioning, the duo's feverish fans rush to Twitter. One of them posts a video of herself in the hospital, pushing her IV drip over to the nearest window, phone in hand, the better to capture the nearest signal. She doesn't want to lose her place in the digital waiting room. On my way to the window, trying to get some signal so I can hopefully get the Shane Dawson x Jeffree Star conspiracy palette, since I wasn't able to leave the hospital and go to a morph store. Everyone seems touched by this act of sincere devotion, myself included. Dawson himself tears up, or rather I should say Dawson himself tweets out a handful of crying emojis. In the conference room from which the launch is being broadcast, someone suggests to the duo of the hour that they might have more clout than the president. And it might just be true. At this exact moment, they're exerting a kind of gravitational pull on millions of people around the world. Like two celestial bodies, Shane and Jeffrey are subtly shifting the trajectory of my orbit mine and that of so many others. The digital waiting room counts over 2.5 million anxious buyers. And on some level, we are all the girl in the hospital pushing her IV drip to the window, refreshing her screen. Four hours later, before I get a chance to buy one for myself, just over a million conspiracy pallets have flown off the pixelated shelves. The collection is sold out. It's a historic moment for the beauty industry. Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> wow. Okay. That was uh, amazing. It was so cool to, to hear, you know, the original French and then the translation back to back. That was like a really nice choice and a nice effect. And I am so glad that that passage about the conspiracy palette, the like Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson um, web series that documented like the creation of this makeup palette and how it broke the internet and it broke like uh, Shopify sales records and it was this big, big thing. Um, it's referred to as shifting the trajectory of my orbit as, as you read, Alex. And I feel like as I was one of those viewers watching that um, web series, I never did purchase the palette myself, but I watched um, enthralled this like, uh, like hours and hours and hours of my life in bed on YouTube watching this web series. Um, it really did shift my orbit orbit for a few weeks. Um, and I was like so surprised and uh, delighted that this was documented in a book. Like I just never really thought, <laughs> I, I'm just like, I'm reading a book about this really specific moment that I felt like low-key almost ashamed of. I'm like, I have no one to share this with. I'm just, I'm secretly uh, really invested in this web series. So to find it legitimized and, and um described in this book so poignantly was like such a meaningful uh surprise to me so it's like really really lovely that that was like the the passage that was read 
Um, I think my first question is for you, Alex, because um, Daphne wrote the book. So I know that, for example, I shared a similar experience um, to her while she was like, just referencing, for example, this one scene that you both read. But for you, who I, I to my knowledge, you're a bit like outside of the beauty and like makeup community. Um, I wanted to know, like, what did you learn translating this book? Like, do you feel invested in in this this made up concept of beauty and influencer, YouTube, all of this kind of stuff? Like, how did that impact you as you were translating? Um, first of all, uh, you're a little bit outside the beauty community is a great way to tell someone they're ugly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing oh, with you. Yeah, exactly. It's very euphemistic. No, um, you're right. Uh, I mean, you know, I was a socialized male growing up and, um, you know, for a long time thought of myself as, as a sort of straight cis male. Um, and that meant that I was very outside the beauty community in a lot of different ways. Um, and there were little instances, I guess, of me kind of being interested in doing things with my sort of look, I guess, that never really took off, I guess. I mean, I definitely like put um, um, sort of like liquid paper on my nails uh, in high school <laughs> at some point. <laughs> You know, uh, and I did get a mohawk haircut at one point in like my late teens or early 20s and then was just kind of daunted by the fact that you really have to do stuff to it every day in order to make it, you know, stand up and was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's that's like well beyond me. Um, but I think after coming out as non-binary uh, a few years ago, I did start to kind of take um, this stuff a bit more seriously just as like oh yeah, there's all these possibilities out there. You know, there's all these kind of ways that you can look and ways that you can alter the way you look and ways that you can look better or cooler or, you know, more interesting or more intricate that I'd never really explored before. Um, and so I think, you know, I still don't feel super within the beauty community uh, and, and it's not necessarily a big part of my day today, but um, I think translating this book came at an interesting time in my life where I was sort of becoming more invested in that kind of stuff. Like, okay, I'm dyeing my hair, I'm, I'm wearing nail polish, you know, like I, uh, my partner got me um, uh, an eyeliner uh, thing recently. So now I can, you know, give myself little wings. Um, <laughs> and that's been really nice. <laughs> Is that what you're wearing currently? No. <laughs> Drop the product list. <laughs> I feel like you don't have to be part of the beauty community to kind of like get a grasp of like how it can be important on a cultural level, right? That's what I wanted to show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, Daphne was very clear, I guess, when we first started discussing the possibility of me translating this, that, um, you know, I was like, I'm not as you put it, you know, I'm not really part of the beauty community, uh, you know, like, are you sure that I'm qualified to take this on? And Daphne, you said something like, you know, the, I feel like you understand the writing style and like what this book kind of needs in a translation. Uh, and I can help you out with the basic terminology stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's harder for maybe like a translator who was intimately familiar with all the beauty stuff, but was maybe less comfortable working with Daphne's kind of poetic language um, that would have produced a very different translation. Yeah, I just wanna clarify that I think you are very beautiful, um, Alex, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, I also watch a lot of YouTube videos on uh, black holes and like Einstein's theory of rev relativity, but I don't consider myself part of the nuclear physics like <laughs> community. So it's like, um, it's yeah, I don't I, I feel like I'm just someone who has invested a lot of time like observing said community for some reason. Like I watch a lot of YouTube, I enjoy makeup. So yeah, I, I totally think that that effect is achieved that you don't need to consider yourself like as part of this community to understand um, the significance, uh, the strange <laughs> significance as with that passage of like a, a, a fan or consumer in the hospital rolling their um, uh, <laughs> IV to the window to get more like signal to purchase like a makeup palette, which is wild. Um, yeah. Something Daphne that I thought was such a 
cool aspect uh, that you bring up in the book is how makeup can be an escape from the monetization of time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is like such an interesting concept. I wish I would like you to speak more to it and maybe also to describe um, what your, how you came to this topic as a uh, project to write a book about, because, you know, maybe I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say writing a book is like monetizing time in the same way as, you know, other yeah. uh, jobs, but it is, you know, a big time investment, if you will. And it, it, <laughs> is, work. it is work. So yeah. how did you reconcile those two things? Um, well, first, I would I would say that, like, uh, in terms of like being part of the beauty community, I feel much more like a lurker. Lurker, yeah, like a lurker. <laughs> like, I don't sure. participate, and I'm also like francophone, and I just feel like you know I follow a lot of YouTubers that are uh, speaking in English or like American, and I always feel like a bit like an outsider. Uh, but I've always had like a lot of um, interest. In, uh, about numeric culture and the, the web culture. And I studied uh, web culture uh, and the impact of web culture on poetry. So I was already reading a lot about like, you know, all the sociology surrounding, you know, anything that we do online. And, and I was also invested in to makeup and I started like binge watching these videos because I was studying translation and I was doing a master but I already had done a master so I was like kind of fed up with school and just doing that as a way to procrastinate mm-hmm. and I feel like uh, in you know when you write procrastination is is very valuable and I was getting so invested that like suddenly I got a lot of like you know I felt like this was a a very important topic that nobody was talking about seriously so I wanted to write about it um, and just you know talk about it to my peers intellectual peers and I started the the project as a new uh, newsletter so I started writing a newsletter called show serious a serious thing (laughs) which was kind of a joke because no one takes makeup seriously and I was going to all these launches and like you know uh, social events and trying to convince all the intellectual in Montreal to subscribe to my newsletter (laughs) and did they uh yeah like some of them did like (laughs) men women like all kind of people and and they actually really enjoyed it so I knew I was you know doing something that was relevant and as of like the monetization of time it's it's very hard to talk about that because anything that we that is beneficial in a way is co-opted by capitalism so makeup is like super capitalistic in a way and even like self-care or what we think of self-care but for me um I like personally like I talk about my personal experience in the book and I've I've been judged all my life for my use of artifice and makeup especially from significant others and I've started like putting on makeup even though I was celibate and like not seeing anyone or just staying in my bed and it was a pandemic and it was very for me, it was like a ritual and grounding <laughs> and, and something I was do, doing just for me and just for the sake of it or just like a moment in time in the morning that I was just drawing, like doing a drawing. And yeah, this is the significance I had put into the act of, you know, make, making myself up, but it's, you know, very shifting. Like all of these things we do, the values, the meanings, they always change. So I can say it was not capitalistic, but at the same time, of course, like because I'm presenting myself as like, you know, normative kind of beauty, I, 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 I feel like I can benefit, benefit, uh, that I get a benefit, benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, it, it's just like a hazy territory and I wanted to explore this too. Yeah. yeah, like mur- I, murky waters. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There, the, you definitely complicate it in a way that that um, really represents the murky waters well. I think. Why, but, 
Um, I, I feel like it's just so, it, it really struck me in this like hustle culture of like, you know, especially um, in the artistic hustle culture of the right. gig economy of like of always course. having to be like working on something, invoicing for something, being productive. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this idea of like, and also you bring up the fact that, uh, you know, people who who like uh, you're talking about folks who let's say buy the conspiracy palette and it costs yeah. like let's say 56 dollars or something 52 talk- us dollars or something like that yeah, yeah. 52 <laughs> us dollars and you calculate yeah. how many hours of work am i exchanging for this makeup palette and throughout my life i have often made these calculations how much uh, is this dinner going to cost me in hours yeah. of labor like do i yeah. want to order an extra side of fries how much is that going to cost yeah. me in working hours like as someone who's considered those things before it was interesting to think about this frivolous let's say or like fluffy time spend of just doing your makeup for no one else's benefit but yourself yeah uh, is really yeah an escape from that having to be always productive always making money always thinking about um yeah doing something like of value so I, I, that was also something I never really read about before and put in such a way that was like resonating so strongly with me. Well, in a way, I feel like while writing the book, I kind of like make a parallel between putting on my makeup and writing because both of these activities are not really, you know, uh, deemed lucrative in a capitalist world and yeah like for me also as a poet I work a lot with images and and for me like putting on makeup is like a I work a lot with colors you know my first poetry book beautiful is named after a a color of nail polish like it's (laughs) it's really for me I it's weird because I'm not someone that is very visual, but I really work with images in my writing and, and it's just translate well into like making up my face in the morning. And for me, the, both of these activities are not really, you know, they are kind of, there is no explanation or no real logic between like, why would I do that? Like, I just do that to survive. It's my mean of my tool of survival. Yeah. And not to be cynical, but like writing, you know, if you stay home and put on your makeup and no one sees it, or if you stay home and write something that doesn't immediately have an audience, like who cares? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that the stakes are for you and not yeah. necessarily, you don't get that external validation necessarily if you're just alone in your bed, putting on your makeup or alone in your bed, writing something that you're not immediately sharing oh my god yes and writing is is something that is time consuming sometimes you know you have to write for months before you get to the point where you're really writing like there's so much (laughs) i don't know uh it you don't see the time the same way when you're involved when your whole life is involved in in um you know committed to writing and for me the the parallel was there (laughs) and we we, we're also you know we we could criticize someone like who do you think you are like you know doing this and being a poet uh, you you know you're you're never gonna make it and it's it's like you're you're having fun and that's why you're sad and like you're you know there's all these like cliches and stereotypes that you could apply to both yeah oh I love it Alice, <laughs> I feel like speaking about poetry, um, I just feel like because you are also a poet, Alex, that you just had such a special touch when when translating this. And I wanted right. to maybe ask a little bit about that. Like, do you think, because this is your first translation, I'm sure not your last, um, because you're so talented and did such a great job. Um, <laughs> but I, do you feel like your your faculties as a as a poet uh, were pulled into this endeavor as as translator as well? Like um, the the work itself is inherently poetic. Um, so I'd I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about yeah, how you pull those elements in. For sure. Um, well, so the genesis of me translating this was reading the first few pages of Mekier on a park bench in Jari Park. Um, on my way to hang out with Daphne as she was having a little book launch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, like a so-called book launch yeah, exactly. because it was a pandemic. So. Right, exactly. It was still 
it was like it had to be outdoors and we were all kind of distanced and <laughs> um you may do <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. it wasn't um uh it wasn't a conventional launch in any sense but you know i i, I missed seeing people and i definitely had been talking about this book on instagram and it sounded interesting so i bought it a copy at drawn and quarterly on my way to jari <laughs> and just kind of was like before i roll up to this event i should just like <laughs> to just read a little bit and I sat down on this bench like I don't know 50 meters away from where she was actually <laughs> hanging out with people and I just started reading it and immediately I was just like oh my god this is so good and interesting and it just kind of scratched something that I hadn't seen I mean the first few pages uh we don't really get into this uh a ton in the excerpts we read but um, the, the, the baby, um, that the pop star and, and the billionaire have together is a reference to Grimes and Elon Musk. Um, and Daphne talks a little bit about the weirdness of having known, you know, of Grimes kind of prior to her rise to international kind of super fame, um, in this relationship. And that was, I had a similar experience, you know, where like there were a few connections between us, like we, we never met, but um, it just felt so close to my experience and to, um, and it just pr produced this sense of like, there, like, I almost wish that I had written this, you know, like, um, and, and, and that, that, this book kind of needed to be in English, you know, <laughs> like I, I was just like, oh my God, like this has to, you know, and then the more I read, you know, Daphne obviously uh, is in conversation with a lot of English language authors in the book. And there's a lot of text uh, in the French original that's English um, and not translated uh, such as it is, which it feels like a very Quebecois gesture. Um, and I just sort of translated the first few pages out of this kind of sense of like, I like them so much. This is so interesting. And I know that a lot of people, a lot of Montrealers will get a kick out of this. Um, and in trying to get them published, I reached out to Daphne and I was like, Hey, you know, can I get your permission? And she wanted to read them. And having read them, she was like, Oh, this is, this is interesting. This is, you know, you did an interesting, uh, job of this I guess and so when we started talking more seriously about me doing the whole book which felt very daunting because as I said I'm not part of the beauty community um and oh, I thought you were gonna say it felt daunting because it was your first translation <laughs> no no but, but like because I'm not part of the beauty community and also on top of that because I've never translated more than you know like very small things for myself and I'd never shown translation to anyone before um I was just kind of like, oh, this is a really tall order. Um, and I just kind of, every time that started to freak me out, I would just come back to the reaction Daphne had to the first few pages that I translated, which was, this is really good. You are capturing kind of the poetic essence uh, that, that I'm trying to have in the original. Because, you know, uh, this is the sort of, like, a, I guess a thing about translation is you can't always reproduce exactly um, the sort of unique quality of a given passage, you know, in the new language, but with enough space, you can, what I was sort of doing, pardon me, it was injecting. <laughs> it's, it's my trademark. Uh, no, it's it, mine. <laughs> oh, okay. Sort of, I just always burp every reading without fail. Um, was sort of injecting moments of poetry in spaces where they made sense in English. Uh, if, if, the, if I couldn't make them work, you know, uh, sort of as a direct kind of um, transformation of Daphne's original, I would be like, well, I wasn't able to, to render that quite as poetically as she did. But over here, there's a, there's a little bit of space where she said something more straightforwardly, and I'm going to add a little bit there. Right. And sort of the hope is that over the course of a book, you kind of get the same amount of poetry, um, even if it's not always in the same places. Yeah, I mean, that's so fascinating because I, I mean, 
I know there are there is such thing as like collaborative poetry but I personally feel like writing poetry is a very solitary like endeavor for for me um and I know from translators <laughs> that translation is such a collaboration um between you know two texts two minds uh could you speak a little bit about what it was like to collaborate together because I imagine like you work very closely together to make certain decisions um even though I do agree that like your, both of your poetic sensibilities definitely like created such a harmony um but how was it working alongside each other to, to accomplish this well I can start <laughs> well as I'm a literary translator myself so I think that for me, it was a like very beautiful collaboration. And I just felt that Alex had the intuition that is like required when you translate uh, poetry or like a literary text. And it's rare to see that in someone and especially people who study, you know, translation because we get uh, used to like rules and and you have to unlearn all these rules uh, in order to be able to really you know translate uh, create and I think that Alex um, has that intuition <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you Daphne That's so beautiful <laughs> oh, I think I mean but the other thing that felt important to me was that because Daphne is a translator herself she and and I guess is conscious of the interplay between intuition and rules. Mm -hmm. I feel like she gave me a lot of free reign uh, with this that sort of like it was it was really useful because I think had I been translating something where uh, I wasn't sort of able to talk to the author about specific choices of words and like what a certain word or a certain phrasing might might sort of mean in terms of like you know uh, the author's original intentions or whatnot um <clears throat> i don't know what kind of a job i would have done but i felt like having daphne working with me was sort of like uh like a safety net almost like i knew that daphne would steer me right um you know and then if i was going a little too crazy she would rein me in her if I was making a mistake you know and there were there were times where I completely misunderstood what she was trying to say and she was able to kind of um guide me I guess um and that was it, it gave me yeah like this sense of like it's going to be okay um <laughs> which I might not have had otherwise you know in in doing kind of like such a big first translation project I guess yeah, would you say that there was a lot of like trust and vulnerability between you two then? <laughs> I I think so. Like uh, it was a both a first for both of us because I've never been translated before. Um so it's an experience for Oh wow, me. I actually didn't realize that. So this was your first time being translated into English. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And cool. it was oh, I, lucky I Anglos we are, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it was a much more like an enjoyable experience that I what I've been through because the book has had like success in Quebec so it was published in France and when it was published in France I had to go out to through the process of culturally adapting my book mm -hmm. which was very colonial in a way and very much uh, I felt like violent and I had to change so many things in my book like even the beginning or like tone down the politics of it and oh wow so I was living both at the same time so the experience of like being translated into English and having this dialogue with Alex and um, trying to you know remain faithful to my voice with the French audience which was very confrontation confrontational, yeah. But uh, with Alex, we we have like a new object that I feel proud of, and that's <laughs> what is good, you know. When I wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Seriously, I'm like. <laughs> I don't mean to break up this love fast. <laughs> <laughs> um that was great thank you thank you very much everybody um i 
we don't have any questions yet. I actually have a question to kick us off. But um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please, please uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A for either Daphne, Alex, or, or Dominica, or whoever. Uh, I'm not taking questions. Um, <clears throat> but Alex, actually, I have a question for you to kick us off. This was your first translation. It's mm -hmm. a, it was a pretty big project. Um, did you learn anything? Because you just sort of hit the ground running with translating here. Did you learn anything overall um, about translating that maybe you wouldn't repeat next time or something that you learned you were very strong at? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the things I learned was that uh, I can translate. <laughs> you know, like uh, that wasn't something that I really um, you know, like I, 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 my, my mom uh, is a translator and has been translating both uh, sort of literary and more technical things since not long after I was born. Um, and so, the, the, you know, there's a bit of a legacy there, I guess, but I hadn't really ever thought of myself as wanting to do literary translation, um, even though, you know, as I said, I had done some little um, jaunts into it, I guess, uh, over the years where I translated little bits of text in French that I found uh, poetic or meaningful or whatever, just for myself. And then, you know, I also had a long running tweet thread about sort of uh, the kind of <laughs> uh, translating where I translated sort of French words and terms into into their kind of literal English equivalent and, and kind of mining that for uh, interesting little nuggets of, uh, I don't know, cultural strangeness or, or poetry or whatnot. Um, but it really kind of came out of nowhere when Daphne said, you know, do you want to translate this? And, and I really had to kind of, it, it felt like, you know, one of those Looney Tunes things where I was just like running off the cliff and being like, okay, don't look down, you know? <laughs> um, and as you said, so like, yeah, I didn't hit the ground running. I hit the air running. <laughs> um, you know, it was, and, and, and because, uh, you know, uh, we were, I think the sense was, this is a very kind of current book. Daphne was writing it during the pandemic. We wanted to, you know, bring it to English audiences before, uh, Elon Musk and Grimes broke up, you know, for instance. <laughs> we were, <laughs> Long time. Yeah, exactly. We got in under the wire <laughs> there. But, like, um, so I, I, I mean, I, I did the initial kind of, you know, first draft of the translation in about two months. Um, and thankfully, oh. Montreal was under curfew. Uh, so I, and, and it was the winter, so I really <laughs> had zero social life from like mid-January to mid-March. It was like every day, wake up, translate, go to bed, you know, like, um, but I think not having time to kind of overthink it, not having time to sort of, you know, get too precious or whatever was really useful because I just went into it with this mentality of like, okay, when I translated those first few pages that Daphne liked so much, I didn't overthink that. That was a really just kind of first thought and best thought almost. Um, and so I applied that same sort of ethos, I guess, um, to, you know, the, 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 those two, those two crazy months and uh, it came off as far as, I don't know, more technical stuff. I can't think of any at the moment, but it was just very affirming for me to kind of discover that this was something I could do and that uh, Daphne's faith in me did not feel tragically misplaced by the <laughs> end of the experience. But correct me if I'm wrong, two months to, to um, do like a first pass is seems very quick for a translation. Like I don't really, I'm not a, I don't know much about much, but that seems, <laughs> is, was it, is that considered like very quick to do a first pass of a translation? I think it's, it's quick, but like a translation is as consuming as writing. So you want to get it, you know, you, you want to get through it as fast as you can because it just absorbs all your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's as like same thing as writing. For example, if I'm translating that now I'm talking over Alex, but if I some, certainly I just like can't find the right sentence to translate something, I'll go running or like putting on my makeup and then I'll suddenly it will come up to me and I will have this wonderful idea. So it just takes over all your body and your mind and you can't really do anything while you're doing that. 
So you want to <laughs> turn the yeah, page. I was in awe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, honestly, like, uh, as a freelance journalist, you know, I work not even remotely like 40 hours a week. Uh, and during the course of this, tr uh, the translation kind of, you know, the, the, the wild drive to get this done on time, I feel like, you know, I, I was reintroduced to the sensation of your brain being tired. You know, like I would get to the end of the day and I'd be like, ah, I've been thinking for eight hours. Like, oh my God, I forgot how to do this. Um, but like Daphne said, uh, it, it was deeply kind of consuming, but it was consuming at exactly the right time because it was like, it was a pandemic. Uh, there was a curfew. It was the dead of winter. You know, I wasn't seeing anyone. I wasn't doing anything. And this was like the perfect time for me to just kind of absolutely plunge like head first into <laughs> something and and not come up until the springtime <laughs> you both yeah. feel like you burned pretty hot and fast on this like the book's almost bookended by grimes and elon musk's relationship right? <laughs> like and now that that's come to a close it, it wasn't even that long but it's, it seems central <laughs> to everything that's happened here yeah it's also it, really it, funny to bring up that like i feel everyone in montreal or anyone who's like art adjacent in Montreal has like a, a Grimes story or experience or is at least one person removed from like a Grimes story like my ex's sister made out with Grimes once at like a warehouse party or something and I'm just like oh yes my Grimes story yeah. <laughs> that all Montrealers have in some way or, or another that is the dream I think you know is, is everyone in your in your hometown well, I mean I know she's not from Montreal but for everyone to have a story about you <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I talk about it in the book, but I lived in Taipei, and when I was in Taipei, she came to Taipei to do a show, and we all got, like, free tickets to see her show, because she was, like, a friend of a friend. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, we have, like, some question I see in the, um, the chat. We do. We have one question from Lee. <laughs> yeah. Make um, a question. Not book related, but <laughs> save current makeup products. This is for any and all panelists. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, on a makeup product. I, uh, and there's also a reference to All Day I Dream about Sirens. I can say two things. Like one is like that your book is like talking about Starbucks in a way or like, you know, cultural references like that. And I think that's, that is the case with made up too. Like, I, you know, invest poetically and theoretically some, you know, pop culture concept like pumpkin spice latte or <laughs> you know, Starbucks coffees. Uh, so someone said, if you haven't yet buy made up and all day I dream about sirens and I say yes. Um, <laughs> and for makeup, uh, I would say this is silly I, I never do that because I I don't want to like people to buy stuff but I <laughs> really like obsessed with a uh, wing eyeliner and I really like the um, the eyeliner that is made by physician formula and it's drugstore and it's not it's not that expensive and it's just like super good to draw a line and it lasts forever that's it <laughs> wow my favorite <laughs> drugstore eyeliner um and i've tried every like silly eyeliner under the sun but my favorite one is from nyx and oh, it's I like in a pen yeah that I think one it's good. called like ink epic liner like yeah. ink liner something like I that but it's the one. pen version yeah. not the like dip pot version no no i have this one too but did you try the physician formula no i'm getting <laughs> It's on my, my list. That's the one. <laughs> my my favorite uh, drugstore eyeliner, which I just ran. Oh, got. what a shape. Flash, Flash Cat Eye by Infallible L'Oreal. Um, it comes with this li this little guy. So you can just kind of. Oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. It, it feels very like uh, training training wheels a little bit, but it's, <laughs> it's how, it, it, it was great. Uh, my partner Blair got it for me and it's really kind of helped me jump into the, the eyeliner game so that's that's okay I used to use like tape like scotch tape to like help me uh and, and that does not feel good when, when you're ripping nope. it off <laughs> so this is probably just like <laughs> an innovative uh solution that works yeah. so good <laughs> well 
unless there is any other questions, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, congratulations to Daphne and Alex. This is incredible. So thank you so much uh, for letting Coach House publish this incredible book and congratulations to you both tonight. Uh, Dominica, thank you so much. It's really nice to see you again. All day I dream about sirens. Uh, if you like poetry and you haven't read it, you should probably read it. It's very good. Um, Thank you to the audience. Thank you to everyone came to help celebrate tonight. Um, there are some links in the chat to buy these books, uh, especially made up. If not from us, please, please, please get it from your local independent bookstore. In fact, if you can just do that, you know, like keep us as the last option. We'll just get it if you can't get it there. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dominica. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Everyone coach us. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. <all>. Bye. <laughs>